Next, we have Michael Muhammad Knight, who will be speaking. Um, he has a brief bio in your brochure. Um, Michael's the author of eight books. He is an American novelist, a journalist, a performance artist, a social critic, and a scholar. He's currently uh, pursuing his PhD in religious studies at UNC Chapel Hill and received his master's in theological studies from Harvard. Um, his most recent book is William S. Burroughs versus the Quran. It came out last week, and um, that was his eighth. So, could you welcome Muhammad. I mean, Michael, sorry, Michael Muhammad. First, I'd like to say salams and peace. Um, and thanks to Eliasani, uh, Catherine M. Coughlin, uh, Christina Friedlander, uh, everyone at the Prince Al Walid bin Talal Islamic Studies program for dealing with me. Like, as was mentioned, I'm a grad student and I'm kind of out of my mind all the time, so I appreciate the patience. Uh, and, and finally, I'd like to say, you know, this is what it is, but I really look forward to the Q&A. Uh, I know today's degree in the, eight, you know, in the one to 10, so I'm gonna try not to like live that out, you know? Um, the five percenters relationship to Muslim identity, both in terms of the nation of Islam and broader Islamic tradition, remains widely misunderstood outside the five percenter community and fiercely contested within it. At stake in the question of five percenters and Islam is not only the issue of authentic Islamic belief and practice, but also authentic blackness, as the rejection of Muslim identity by some five percenters incorporates an Afrocentric critique of Islam as an ideology of Arab supremacy parallel to the critique of Christianity's ties to white supremacy. Today I will discuss five percenter engagements and rejections of Islam with attention paid to the intersection of religious and racial authenticity. The five percenter movement was founded in 1964 when Clarence 13X Smith, a former member of the Nation of Islam's Harlem Mosque, uh, renamed himself Allah and began sharing the NOI's secret initiatory text, the Supreme Wisdom Lessons, with uh, teenagers on street corners who were not affiliated members of the Nation of Islam. Uh, Allah taught that the meanings of the lessons could be properly unlocked through his own algebraic code, as Dr. Miyakawa has explained, uh, the supreme mathematics. Smith's renaming of himself as Allah signaled a meaningful rebellion against the nation of Islam, uh, which held that Allah had appeared in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, who had then appointed Elijah Muhammad as his messenger in the wilderness of North America. In his claim to be Allah, the former Clarence 13X undermined Elijah Muhammad's authority and ownership of what Master Farad Muhammad had given him. So from this point on, uh, it's kind of inappropriate to call him Clarence because that wasn't his name at this point. It would be like calling Malcolm X Malcolm Little. So when I say Allah, I'm not saying that I pray to the man, but that was his, his name. So uh, an even more radical departure from the Nation of Islam occurred when Allah shared his name with his community, declaring that all black men were entitled to call themselves Allah. This innovation, while well, based on Allah's reading of the lessons, represented an extreme democratization of the theology furthered by Elijah Muhammad. For Elijah Muhammad, all black men were gods, but one best knower, namely Master Farad Muhammad, reigned supreme as Allah. In the five percenter view, every black man was equally his own Allah, with no transcendent authorities above him. In this vision of divinity resting solely within the self, Allah disavowed affiliation with any organized religion. After his institutionalization for nearly two years at Madawan State Hospital for the Criminally Insane, uh, he would say that the authorities there at that institution said, Allah, you know, we don't have your service here. We don't have your religious service. And he said, well, if you mean Muslim service, that's not my service because I don't have a religion. Um, in a, an interview in 1968, Allah mocked the Nation of Islam's deification of Master Farad Muhammad and compared the NOI to the Catholic Church for its claim to represent the wishes of an unseen, unknowable deity. Uh, Allah, by his own self-identification, was not a Muslim. He understood that his name was offensive to Muslims. Uh, and he actually encouraged five percenters to distance themselves from uh, Muslim identity. So five percenters who had Muslim names, he encouraged them to, to drop those. And he also discouraged the use of assalamu alaikum as a greeting, saying, well, you know, if Arabic's not your language, why don't you say in a language that you understand? So this is why five percenters greet each other with uh, peace. Allah did not leave behind a published manifesto. And the five percenter's rapid growth after his assassination in 1969 led to some confusion over the five percent's proper relationship to Islam. After all, five percenter thought had grown out of an interpretation of Nation of Islam teachings, and the words Islam and Muslim do appear in the lessons that five percenters regard as their crucial text. Uh, the lessons describe the black man's, quote, own self as, quote, a righteous Muslim. 
In the late 1970s, following the reorientation of the Nation of Islam towards Sunni Islam under the leadership of Imam Muradin Muhammad, some 5%ers began referring to themselves as the 5% Nation of Islam. When Minister Louis Farrakhan revived the Nation of Islam in 1978, some 5%ers joined his new movement, and it appears that the boundary between Farrakhan's Nation of Islam and the 5% Nation of Islam blurred for some on both sides. So in the mid-1980s, uh, contemporary to Minister Farrakhan's rise to national prominence, uh, there was also a movement among the five percenters to kind of repeat this divorce that Allah had performed in the 60s. Um, that this movement reified the five percent as an autonomous, distinct movement, uh, clearly separated from any kind of Muslim community. So during these years in the mid-80s, the community was renamed the Nation of Gods and Earths. Uh, this change was justified with quotes attributed to Allah. Um, the community began producing its own, you know, official media, the, the word, which was notable for publishing a biography of Allah that really emphasized the difference. So in this biography, it's you know, drawing upon Allah as the producer of his own tradition and five percenters as possessing their own autonomous culture. In the nation of gods and earths era, five percenter discourse has made the repeated assertion that five percenters are not Muslims. Some five percenters, however, have resisted this shift away from Islam, and they've identified as both five percenters and Muslim. Uh, these, quote, Muslim gods, as they've been known in the community, face challenges from non-Muslim 5%ers both on theological and racial grounds. First, they're seen as inauthentic in their adherence to 5% thought on God. Uh, as 5%ers teach that the black man is God, and the word Muslim signifies one who submits, the argument is made that you can't really be God and also someone who submits to God. Uh, additionally, these Muslim gods are also assessed through the lens of an Afrocentric critique of Islam, uh, which would render them inauthentic performers of their blackness. An Afrocentric polemics against Islam, furthered most famously by Malefi Asante in the 1980s, quote, adoption of Islam is as contradictory to the diaspora and Afrocentric city as Christianity had been, unquote. While Muslim polemicists could discuss the role of Christianity in the slave trade, colonialism, and white supremacy, Asante argues that Islam is itself Arab supremacy, forcing converts to adopt Arab language and culture and essentially recognize Arabness as divine. The psychological damage caused by the portrait of a white Jesus on the wall, demanding that black people pray to a God who does not look like them, uh, and the Afrocentric critique is seen as paralleled by Islam's reverence of divine text, the Quran, as authentic only in the language of its revelation. Uh, so the idea is that you know, European Christians made God look like a white man, and Arab Muslims made God sound like an Arab. This charge would have precedent in earlier work, such as Chancellor Williams' The Destruction of Black Civilization in 74, which argued that prior to uh, European colonialism, African nations had been brutalized by Arab conquests, the Arab slave trade, and Islamic hegemony. So Islam, in this view, is no less anti-black or less an enemy of African heritage than Christianity. Uh, tensions between these competing visions of Islam as either a pro-black religion or an ideological tool of Arab power can even be found in the discourse of Elijah Muhammad. So earlier in his career, uh, Elijah Muhammad identified Arabs as black people, um, but, you know, by the 70s, with uh, increasing tensions between the Nation of Islam and Sunnis, Elijah Muhammad changed his views on the Arabs' racial identity. Uh, and he said that, you know, the old Islam was run by white people and the new Islam would be run by black people. Uh, the Afrocentric antagonism towards Islam would inform in, uh, intracommunal polemics between Muslim 5%ers and non-Muslim 5%ers. Uh, debates in online 5%er forums include references to, quote, pale Arabs and, quote, that camel-riding religion of the 7th century. And quote, the word Islam uh, has been broken down with two backronyms to demonstrate the difference between five percenters and Muslims. So I've seen, you know, as has been explained, as Dr. Miyakawa explained, um, there's all these positive renditions of Islam for five percent. Um, you know, I self lord and master, you know, personal self-empowerment, uh, whereas they might denigrate Muslims as uh, following an Islam that stands for individuals submitting lowly, acting Muhammad. So there's this argument that, you know, by being religiously Muslim, you're becoming other than your own self. Uh, these concerns of religion and race would intersect in the case of firstborn Prince Allah, who was regarded as one of the original nine teenagers to have joined the 5% in the 1960s. Firstborn Prince Allah, while identifying as a 5%er and member of the Nation of Gods and Earths, nonetheless attended congregational Juma prayers at Masjid Malcolm Shabazz, uh, the Harlem Mosque that was once led by Malcolm X. Even more outrageously, he shocked and offended many 5%ers by actually performing Salat in the Allah School, which was the 5%ers headquarters in Mecca. And he would recite very loudly, almost you know, deliberately loudly, as some would charge, uh, in Arabic. Uh, firstborn Prince Allah was often seen wearing an Arab kafiya, which led to derision of him as sporting, uh, in the words of one elder, quote, that Yasser Arafat rag on his head, unquote. 
And uh, in an audio recording of Firstborn Prince Allah reciting the Supreme Wisdom Lessons, we additionally hear him reciting short surahs uh, from the Quran in Arabic. Firstborn Prince Allah is said to have recognized that he was God while performing wudu. So he's actually doing an Islamic ritual. He's preparing for Islamic prayer. And he looks in the bathroom mirror, and he sees himself, and he recognizes that he's praying to himself. So for Prince Allah, uh, the question of being Muslim and 5% was not a contradiction, because it was through practice of one that he realized the truth of the other. Uh, and it appears from his writings that he desired other 5%ers to make these similar navigations. Uh, in recent years, a group of Muslim 5%ers, known collectively as the Allah team, has sought to rehabilitate Islamic identity for the 5%, both in terms of religion and race. Allah team author Wakil Allah, who is a student of Firstborn Prince, wrote two histories of the 5%er movement, which assert that not only had Allah, the former Clarence 13X, uh, remained a faithful and loyal Muslim, despite his leaving the mosque, and despite his own statements to the contrary, um, uh, but that he also saw himself as a follower of Elijah Muhammad and instructed his disciples that in the wake of his death, uh, the 5%ers should return to the nation of Islam. Additionally, Allah team member True Islam, better known as Dr. Wesley Muhammad, presents Islam as an authentically black religion in his work. So I'm going to talk about him a little bit, and I should also clarify that when I say true Islam says, or true Islam argues, I'm actually talking about a person. I'm not making a theological argument here. Um, so true Islam says that uh, not only had Islam emerged from largely an African context, but also that the Prophet Muhammad had black ancestors, uh, black descendants, and that even that Allah was, a worshipped, was worshipped as a black god by pre-Islamic Arabs and uh, in the pantheons of the surrounding uh, civilizations, such as you know, the sun god Ra in Egypt and the, the trickster god Enki in Mesopotamian religion. True Islam asserts that Islam began as a black religion only to be, quote, Aryanized when the black Umayyad Caliphate was overthrown by the, quote, red Persian Abbasid revolution. In true Islam's vision of history, the spread of Islam beyond its black milieu led to red Persians and white Turks corrupting the religion, rendering Islam's origins as a black movement unimaginable for today's Muslims and non-Muslims alike. This, quote, Aryanization is also seen to have impacted the lives of non-Muslims under Islamic rule, as true Islam asserts that uh, during the time that Islam was, quote, a black thing, was also the era in which Muslims were most tolerant of uh, minority religions under their rule. In his contention that the original Arabs who followed Muhammad would be categorized as, quote, black in today's constructions of race, true Islam seeks to neutralize the Afrocentric claims that Islam promotes conformity to a culture that is alien or even hostile to black people. Authentic blackness is tied into a vision of authentic Islam, as true Islam idealizes the earliest Muslim community as the most connected to blackness and Africanity, and also asserts that this community saw God as a man with a physical body. For true Islam, therefore, the nation of Islam's teachings of black supremacy and embodied anthropomorphism are by no means, quote, heretical, but in fact truer to the Prophet's original mission than uh, modern Salafis of today. How are we on time? We good? All right. Uh, these concerns are not unique to the 5% or tradition, uh, as other African American Islamic communities have had to navigate between claims for authentic Islam and authentic blackness. In the years following the 1975 uh, passing of Elijah Muhammad, we see Warath Dean Muhammad reorienting the nation towards Sunnism, uh, but he continues the, uh, the connection of Islam to authentic blackness by emphasizing the role of Bilal, the Ethiopian uh, companion of the Prophet Muhammad, um, thus building a, a bridge to the NOI to the larger Islamic Ummah and also demonstrating this, uh, this crucial place of blackness in Islam's heritage. Um, in terming members of his community to be Bilalians, Warathin Muhammad enabled a new usable history to accompany the movement away from his father's teachings, and this smoothened out that transition. For Minister Farrakhan's NOI revival, however, uh, black authenticity and Islamic authenticity were both achieved through faithfulness to the teachings of Elijah Muhammad. The Ansaro Law community, which originated in the 1970s Brooklyn and thrived in uh, the 1980s as kind of a Brooklyn parallel to Harlem's Five Percenters, um, also made claims on both authentic Islam and authentic, authentic blackness. Uh, for the Ansar Law, this was achieved by a heavy use of Arabic text in their pamphlet literature, um, a heavy emphasis on normative Islamic practice, what they saw as normative Islamic practice, and in fact, uh, a hyper-normative idea of Muslim dress for both men and women, and connections to the Sudanese Mahdiya. Uh, additionally, though the Ansars did not actually identify as Shia, they supported Ali's right to succession and integrated this into their own uh, ideology on race by representing Ali and Fatima as black, 
uh, and Abu Bakr as this pale usurper. So in the in the art of the Ansarul law community, you see this this pale Abu Bakr, you know, arguing with with Fatima, you know, as he's depriving her of her rightful inheritance from her father and marginalizing Ali from his rightful position of power. Um, we even see Islam's authentic blackness defended today within contemporary Sunni discourses, such as Imam Zaid Shakir's essay, Islam, Prophet Muhammad, and Blackness, in which he discusses the Prophet's numerous close companions of Ethiopian descent, such as Zaid ibn Haritha, whom the Prophet described as his own son. Additionally, in Islam and the Black American, uh, Sherman Jackson skillfully argues against the charges of, uh, discussed from Afrocentrist uh, thinkers such as Asante and what Jackson calls Black Orientalism. Even for five percenters who do not identify as Muslims, there can be an imperative to display a certain Islamic authenticity. Five percenters who deny affiliation with Islamic religion might nonetheless argue that they possess a superior understanding of Islam's true meanings. Uh, this argument is often made through a breaking down of the Arabic word Islam as meaning not submission, but rather uh, best expressed in the, in the root letters you know, relating to peace. Uh, and Muslim is not one who submits, but rather, quote, as one of peace. Additionally, some non-Muslim five percenters will make their claims that, in the words of Rakim, it even tells us we are gods in the Holy Quran. So they'll draw upon verses um, such as, you know, Allah telling the prophet after the prophet had thrown dust in the eyes of his enemy in battle, that it was not you who threw, Allah threw. So they'll look at verses like this and say, well, you know, there's this separation between man and God is somewhat artificial. Um, they will also draw upon Sufism particularly the ecstatic utterances of saints such as Mansur al-Hajj and Abu Yazid al-Bistami, uh, which provide a means for five percenters to stake a claim on the Islamic tradition without putting themselves under the authority of any kind of clerical institutions or discourses. The five percenter project has been most concerned most urgently with issues of agency, both for the individual God or earth and for original people collectively, advocating freedom of individual conscience and cultural autonomy. Uh, so whatever five percenters do with Islamic tradition, whether as Muslims or non-Muslims, must first and foremost answer this question of agency. Thank you.